A warning that today's episode may be distressing and traumatizing for some listeners. From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. The discovery of 215 Indigenous children in unmarked graves at a former residential school in BC has shaken and horrified Canadians across the country. Tragically, this is just the beginning. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission estimates 4,100 Indigenous children died in the residential school system. But the commission said in its 2015 report, the true death toll is much higher. Basic questions have never been answered by the Canadian federal government or by the churches that ran the schools. Who died? Why did they die? And where are they buried? The discovery in Kamloops was made with ground radar technology and drones at the request of Tecumloops to Shwetmek First Nation. And it has reignited the call for scans and searches at every residential school site in Canada. Joining This Matters is Keisha Supernaut, Director of the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology and Associate Professor at the University of Alberta. Keisha is Métis and has conducted similar investigations of unmarked burial sites. She takes us through the difficult work of finding the graves of residential school victims and the answers it can lead to. Keisha, thank you so much for your time and for your energy. Thank you for having me. What's gone through your mind? In the past few days, hearing the news, processing that the grave sites of 215 Indigenous children have been found. This, of course, has been really heartbreaking and devastating news as an Indigenous person, as someone whose own family has been affected by residential schools, as someone who's done this sort of work with communities, and as a mother of a young child, it is very heartbreaking to hear about this and very tragic I cannot say that I've been surprised or shocked because I know the extent to which children went missing, you know, around residential schools and that there are many, many places where there are children in unmarked graves across the lands we call Canada. In doing all this work too, I guess part of why this is so horrific and there are so many terrible parts to this, is it the not knowing just how many grave sites there are across Canada of missing Indigenous children? I think part of it is not knowing where their resting places are and also not knowing the full extent. So, you know, there's been research done on the archival record. The National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation has created the kind of roster of children that they're able to track who either died or went missing. But the truth is, is that's likely a pretty significant underestimate of how many children's graves there are around residential schools across all the provinces and territories where they existed. Yeah. Even the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said that 4,100 number of Indigenous children that died in the residential school system, it was probably a very low estimate. It's likely thousands more. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, some of those locations, if those children were buried, we might be able to find. I think also the challenge is that we know from Indigenous communities, from the families and the survivors, that there are stories about all kinds of really horrific things happening to the children. And so some resting places or some graves Some children we may never be able to find, but we certainly can do more and use some of the technology to help communities find some resting places of their relatives. Can you take us through what your work looks like in Indigenous archaeology? There's been reporting on how these sites in Kamloops were found through ground radar technology. Can you explain how this kind of investigation works? Yes. So when we're doing a project where Indigenous communities wish to find unmarked graves, we have a set of technologies that we use in archaeology that can be applied to these types of contexts. I think we have to be careful. These, you know, grave sites of children around residential schools, well, in a legal sense, might be considered an archaeological site. They're much more than that. And so I see this type of research as using archaeological methods to explore these We have used ground penetrating radar in unmarked burial searches in Alberta and Saskatchewan as part of the team that I lead at the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology at the University of Alberta. And so we start with the community telling us that 
they want to find these unmarked grave locations. And then we go and talk with the community about what that process looks like, participate in any ceremony that needs to happen. And then we will go out to the sites, often to where the community might point to, this is the places we think these burials are. And we set up a grid and we take our ground penetrating radar machine, which is an antenna, it's a small box, and then we drag it across the surface of the ground looking for these possible grave locations. So a lot of times the information about these sites, they're guided, informed by community members and often residential school survivors as well? Yes, where survivors have that knowledge and are willing to share it with us, it can really help to narrow down locations to look. Of course, the archives do point to some more formal cemetery locations, which were actually built into many residential school plans. Uh, You know, the architects of these knew that their children would die and they built places for that. But then there's other areas that are known in community. So that helps us narrow down our search because it can be time consuming to drag a small box across the ground at these regular intervals to actually look for those possible grave locations. There have been many documented cases at residential schools where there were orders to dig the burial sites deeper, that this was a deliberate cover-up. This is a hiding of the truth. As an archaeologist, is it difficult to find something that people in the past don't want you to find? It can definitely present some new challenges. So like I said, formal cemeteries are easier to locate because of the historical information. And also formal cemeteries tend to be organized in particular ways that help us determine what it is that we're actually seeing. At the same time, these technologies can be used in places where there may be more illicit circumstances, you know, where burials were more clandestine or less formal. But they're harder to be fully confident that what we're seeing is in fact a grave because what the technology, the ground penetrating radar technology are differences in the soil. So if you imagine, you know, there's the soil and then you dig a grave, that changes the soil composition, changes density, that kind of thing. And really what ground penetrating radar finds is the grave shaft. And if there is a coffin, the coffin often has a signature in the radar as well. But we can't actually see bodies using this technology. We really just see the disturbances in the pits. So when graves are a little bit less formal, we have to be really careful about our interpretations to make sure that what we're actually seeing is a grave. And the more methods we can use to confirm that, often the more we can build our confidence. But there are circumstances where it's very difficult to know for sure whether or not we're seeing a grave without other more invasive technologies being used. We'll be right back. Do you think that technology has really helped in allowing this process to be done perhaps in a more culturally appropriate way, in a more respectful way, that it has allowed you to get again into places that can be very difficult to access? Yeah, I think so. And I think also the providing reassurance for communities that this is sort of minimally invasive. We are still pulling a box across the ground. We're still sending a signal below the ground, but we're not going in and having to dig things up. And I think that's a lot, you know, for many communities, that might be something they never are able to do because it is too painful, too traumatizing, and they may wish to only just pursue protecting and commemorating these places. But there are other communities who might want to pursue identification of the children and also looking for cause of death so that justice and accountability can be part of the conversation as well, because, you know, many of these children died under circumstances where they shouldn't have died. Right? That if they had been at home, and if they'd been cared for, the outcome would have been different. I've seen that you've mentioned that this approach is different, that it's important to you that this is not research being done on Indigenous communities, but really, especially in this case, it's research by and for Indigenous communities to find the truth about what happened to these children. Is that something that really, I guess, informs the way you do your work? It informs the way I do all of my work, not just work in this context. But I feel most strongly about this when it comes to unmarked graves and even more strongly when it comes to residential schools because of the sensitivity and because of the potential to do harm if we're not doing this in a way that is appropriate for the community. 
I think any work that happens, and there's going to be an increase in this, we know that because the type of attention that this story has gotten locally, nationally, and globally, that it has to be done in a way that is driven by the communities themselves. And many of these schools have multiple First Nations and often Métis children who went to any given school. So there needs to be an opportunity for those nations to come together and collectively make a decision about the way that they want to move this work forward. So it has to be done, be community-driven research. And in my broader archaeological research that I do, my work is always geared toward community-driven and community-led projects, and then also ones that explore my own personal family histories. So as a Métis person with deep connections to Alberta families, I'm doing work on the places of my own relatives and working with my community to do that in a way that supports their needs and interests as well. Keisha, what has this work of finding these sites, of bringing some measure of truth, maybe some answers to Indigenous families, what has this work meant to you? I see it as the most important work that I will ever do. I feel in some ways sort of humbled that I'm in this role because I'm doing it entirely for bringing some measure of peace to families whose children have been lost. It is very difficult work. You know, I have done some of it and I anticipate I will be involved in more and it has to be done with such care and such attention to the needs of communities and survivors and researchers like myself who might come in to support communities on this. And walking on the graves of these children is heartbreaking. But at the same time, you know how meaningful it is for these families to be able to know where their children are. And so I feel like I can't not do it. I feel very much that it's been, I don't know, I I guess I feel like the ancestors have asked me to do this in some way, like my own Indigenous ancestors have done that. And I'm just going to do it in the best way that I can, take direction from community. And as soon as I know a better way to do it, I will do it that way. So it is the most meaningful work that I could possibly do, I think, in my career. Among the 94 calls to action, many people have pointed out in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was for the Canadian federal government to commit to finding unmarked burial sites, to document who the children were, to fund that work. And it's that funding part of finding these sites, as you're helping doing now, was denied by the federal government. And of course, as you mentioned, there is now a renewed call by First Nations leaders and community members to really investigate every single residential school site in Canada for unmarked grave sites. You've said that you expect more of this work to continue. I don't expect you to answer for the federal government on what they will or won't do, but do you think that something has changed? Do you think that with this story in Kamloops, there is a shift in how we talk about the residential school system and finding answers about what happened there? I hope there is a sustained change in conversation. You know, we definitely see right now there's this upswelling, we see memorials, we see statements, we see flags being lowered, we see this kind of interest in advocacy and pushing for action. I think that needs to be sustained, absolutely. I do know that the federal government has allocated some funding for these sets of calls to action. The challenge is making sure that the communities are leading, making sure that they have access to the funds that they need, and also making sure that there's a national strategy around providing the best possible uses of these technologies, having established and shared protocols around how we go from, you know, doing the work on the ground to making an interpretation of a grave, and then providing the best options for communities about the different ways that they can proceed with this work. I do think we are going to see an increased uptake in communities of wanting to do this work, and it's just making sure that the resources are provided in an appropriate and in a timely manner. So I have hope that this will move forward and that there will be sustained. But I do think that means we need to prepare for more stories like Kamloops and the impact that that's going to have. I mean, we see the impact that this has on Indigenous peoples already and not just survivors and families, but broadly, many of us who are Indigenous. This has really been a difficult few days. And if these stories are just sort of repeatedly brought up in the news, it's going to continue to have impacts So I always want to say, you know, we need to focus on the legacies and the impacts, but we're still here. And, you know, there are many survivors and there's resilient Indigenous communities and resurgence of Indigenous languages and ways of being that we also really need to support. Because it's not just about the tragic losses, it's about our future as Indigenous peoples in the lands we call Canada.
So I think there'll be more projects. I think there'll be more work. I think there'll be more stories. They have to come from community. Communities have to be ready. We can't just show up on their doorstep with equipment and say, hey, we're here to survey your residential school. That's not the right approach. And we have to recognize that for some communities, they may not be ready yet because it might be too much. And they're focused on having clean water for their communities or dealing with mental health and trying to have housing. I think we just have to be very sensitive to the fact that communities are at different places with this and they will tell us what is needed. And I can just, as a researcher, be ready for when they want a partner. I'm here. This is an ongoing conversation. It's not, as you said, just showing up with equipment. Mm -hmm. It's not. And it can't be because that is not necessarily what is always is needed. Keisha, thank you so much for taking the time to talk and for the very important work that you're doing. Thank you for having me. That is Keisha Supernod director of the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology. If you or anyone you know is experiencing pain, trauma, and emotional distress from residential school experiences, the Indian Residential Schools Crisis Line is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You can call for support at 1-866-925-4419. That's 1-866-925-4419. <laughs> That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Saba Aitizaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattinen, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.